Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Helen He from NERSC Training. Welcome to the OpenMP Training Series Session 4 today. What could possibly go wrong with OpenMP? So we have this session, uh, the training series having six, seven sessions total. Today we are on session four, and we're very happy to have a guest speaker, Ruth Vanderpass. Uh, next session will be September 4th. Uh, it's about monthly um, intervals. So you can find on event main event page, the previous uh, session slides, exercises, recordings. Um, if you miss any session, you can make up. And today at the end, we'll also review the uh, NUMA exercises from previous session. Our speaker, Dr. Ron Vanderpass, um, is also a OpenMP expert. Um, he's a, op, uh, in Oracle Linux, in, in, in works in Oracle as a senior principal software engineer, um, deeply involved in the GNU uh, G prof, yeah, profiling tool and D-trace trace, tracing tool, both for Linux. And he is uh, the co-author of the first OpenMP book, Open, use, using OpenMP portable shared memory, and also the lead author of the uh, second OpenMP book, Using OpenMP, The Next Step, both published by MIT Press. He's one of the um, regulars giving technical talks and tutorials of OpenMP at various events like SC, ISC, IWAMP, etc. cetera. He's very passionate about application performance, OpenMP, and the combination. So thank you, uh, uh, Ruth, for also deliver delivering this uh, training from um, your country, Netherlands, also in the evening time. Uh, some quick logistics today. So everyone is muted. Uh, so uh, we would like you to change your Zoom name to first name and last name. Um, you can um, <clears throat> click your name and edit it. And we have um, turned on CC captioning. So you can turn captions on and off and also view full transcript. We are recording this session and you're free to unmute and ask questions. We prefer you use Slack uh, instead of Zoom to ask questions. So, and if you prefer not to record your voice, you can type and we will uh, either ask, answer them directly in Slack or we will read out the questions to, to the speaker. Uh, if you don't have a nurse account, we have um, enabled, uh, let's send you a private email to allow you to apply for a training account valid for about two weeks. And uh, recordings will be available uh, in a few days after the events. We will also uh, send out a survey link. So please help us to answer the survey questions, help us to improve. So with that, uh, we will start our presentation by, by Ruth. All right, okay, well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Helen, for the, the nice introduction. And uh, thank you all for, uh, for showing up. Uh, I've put together um, a, a quite a quite a long presentation, but I will stick to the time. I, I promise I will just stop talking uh, when it's time, but uh, I, I should be able to finish all the slides. And uh, we should have time for Q&A. And as uh, Helen said, either uh, ask them in the Slack channel right away. I won't be able to see them, um, but uh, she will stop me if, uh, if it's really urgent and otherwise we'll handle the question uh, at the end in the Q&A part. So... Let me um, let me start sharing my uh, my screen and um, and get started. I hope everybody can hear me uh, well. Um, let me see. All right. I hope um, I hope this is visible and I got my my cursor back, so that's good. Looks good. Can you see it, Helen? Is that is that okay? Yes, the slide looks good. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Well, um, I gave this um, this talk uh, the title "What Could Possibly Go Wrong Using OpenMP." A bit of a challenging title, um, but I'm going to um, to to explain that and, of course, go into uh, quite some detail on that. So a little bit about myself. Helen already gave an introduction. Just uh, just a few more things. Um, my background is in mathematics and physics. 
much more mathematics than physics. I'm really bad in physics, but um, yeah. <laughs> so um, I worked at various companies um, and also the University of Utrecht. Um, the last one I worked at was Sun Microsystems. And as some of you may know, Sun Microsystems was taken over by, uh, by Oracle. So since then I've been part of Oracle and uh, for quite some years now, I work in the Oracle uh, Linux engineering organization and get to do really, uh, really fun things with, uh, with open source. I have been involved with OpenMP since it came out. At that time, I was at SGI. SGI was one of the driving forces behind OpenMP because it was a really was a jungle out there. Uh, every vendor had its own parallel programming model, and um, it, it was really. And I was on the benchmarking side, so I had to port applications from one parallel programming model to another. It was a, it was really a pain. So a bunch of people got together and that was how OpenMP was created. And I thought, well, that's cool. And I still think it's cool. And of course, nothing is perfect, um, but I think um, OpenMP uh, has come quite a long way and uh, certainly in many cases can get the job done. So I'm generally, I'm passionate, passionate about performance. I, as I just said, I started um, pretty much doing benchmarks, trying to make other people's, um, people's code go faster. Then OpenMP came along, and I really like the combination. So that's what I'll be talking about, primarily be talking about today. So here's the uh, the very simple uh, simple agenda. I'll I'll have a bit of uh, what I call prologue. That's some sort of background information that uh, I will need in the remainder. For those of you that already know it, I apologize. I'll try to make it uh, quick, but I do want to make sure that everything that I'm going to refer to in the remainder, part one and part two, has been covered in, um, in to some extent. So in the first part, I'll talk uh, about what possibly could go wrong using OpenMP, and then I'm going to, in the second part, I'll talk about computer memory, and, and I'm going to explain why I do that, and of course, all the ins and outs. And at the end, we'll have, well, I always find it funny, Q&A. Um, yeah, you can ask your questions. I don't pretend to have an answer to every question you ask, but I'll do my best, so we'll see. So the prologue. Um, first of all, I want to I want to get rid of some myths, persistent myths. You um, you, know, you may have heard it. People say, "Oh, OpenMP it doesn't scale. You can't get good performance with OpenMP." Well, that's too simple to be true. Uh, you can get good performance, and your code will scale, but you got to do things in the right way. OpenMP is a is a programming model. It's um, it's it sort of gives you the ingredients to make your own dish. And if you, um, and as you know from cooking, uh, you can make really terrible dishes or really delicious dishes. And it's up to you. And um, that's what I'm uh, going to talk about. How do you make sure that the dish is, uh, is right? Uh, here's one sort of uh, confusion. OpenMP is easy to use, and I really like that. I'll say that again soon, and I'll show you some examples. But it doesn't mean you can write, um, let's say, be polite, an inefficient code. If you write inefficient code, you'll get inefficient performance. So that ease of use is a mixed blessing. Um, it does make things a lot easier, and I, I prefer it over the alternative, but it does mean that we have to talk about certain things, and that's exactly uh, why this talk was scheduled. Uh, over the past trainings, you, you've been learning about OpenMP, what it is about. You By now, you've had all the basics. Um, so now it's time to, um, to look at performance of certain things you do in OpenMP. One thing I really like, is that whenever I have an idea on how to parallelize something or change some, something in my parallel code, it's usually very easy and quick to implement. So I don't have to do a complete rewrite. I can pretty much easily do that. It doesn't always mean that you get the best possible performance. Uh, for that, maybe you'll have to go back to the drawing board and, and redesign how you parallelize your code. But certainly, um, uh, it, things are easy in general to, uh, to do. One thing you need to know, some constructs that are seemingly even equivalent are more expensive than others. And um, I don't think that has been documented very well. And that's part of this uh, this talk to help you find your way in like what, what are the do's and the don't do's. And as I just said, if you write dumb code, um, you probably get dumb performance. I'll make that stronger. You will get dumb performance. And why do I say that? Well, OpenMP is very prescriptive. When you think about it, when you use OpenMP, you, you tell the compiler, do this, do that, don't do this. 
you're in charge. You, you make all the decisions and whatever, whatever you do, the compiler will have to follow. It, it should do that. So if you parallelize a loop that only has three instructions and the, and, and the loop is three long, then I don't think you'll get a lot of benefit out of parallel processing. That's a call that you make. And that's why I make it stronger. You got you to gotta be efficient and smart about you know, performance. The one thing is don't blame OpenMP. You can blame, blame anything else, but not OpenMP. Um, I don't have time to really go into this uh, in more detail, but I, I wanted to mention it. Um, in terms of complexity, you start with the most efficient algorithm. There are, um, there are examples of uh, sequential serial algorithms that have been parallelized. And when, when you do that transition, the, the, the code, the algorithm is horribly inefficient. It's parallel, but it's much slower than its sequential counterpart when you run it on a single thread. So you take a huge step back and then you try to recover um, through parallel computing. I don't think that's a good strategy. Uh, start with the most efficient algorithm, even if it has some non-parallel parts where you have to go sequential. That's usually a win. If you if you have a, 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 a algorithm that's order n cube instead of n log n, the n log n is going to win very, very quickly. So think about that before you start. Think about what algorithm you want to use. And again, don't be blinded by blazing scalability only because there's more to it than just that. Um, always use a profiling tool. Yes, as Helen said, I'm working on the GProf and G, uh, GNU uh, profiling tool. Um, but uh, in general, pick your tool, um, whatever you like, but you got to know where the time is spent. When you when you tune an application, you got to know where the time is spent and you're going to tackle the most expensive parts. Don't bother about things that don't that don't contribute to the to the performance. Uh, so always use um, a tool that will tell you where the time is spent and, and that will tell you where to start with your parallelization efforts. Then find the highest level of parallelism. Um, and then I say, but there should be enough work to use many threads. What do I mean with that? Well, let's say you're working on a 3D problem and you're lucky and for at least for a while, um, the work on the three dimensions is independent. So you can parallelize over three dimensions. Well, that's nice, but it won't give you a speed up more than three, no matter how many cores you have access to. So that's probably not a situation you like to be in. So what you try to find in your application, you find a part that has enough work so you can successfully use many cores or threads um, and, and is as high as possible because the higher the level, the least the overhead. Again, I could easily fill another talk talking about these things, which, which, uh, which I don't have time for, but I hope you get the idea. And again, use OpenMP in an efficient way. Another thing when you do performance experiments is that um, I, I routinely have these brilliant ideas that turn out to be make my code slower. So I could give endless talks about how to make applications go slower. Uh, that's just in the nature of performance tuning. You do have that, that great idea and then you try it. And, and again, your, your code is slower. And then you, later you find out it wasn't all that brilliant what you thought to do. Just be patient, keep on trying, maybe put it aside for a while, do something else and then revisit what you did. That's, um, that's just the way it is with, uh, with performance. It's really hard to, unless it's a very obvious case, it's really hard to upfront predict the benefit of something. So I now want to cover some basic technology things, just terminology that I will need in the remainder. First of all, and I'm a bit embarrassed to add up because I'm, I, I think you all know, but I, again, I just want to make sure that it's covered because it will come back later. You, you in a computer system, you have caches, and you have many, and um, and different types of caches. But what are they? A cache is nothing more or less than a fast memory buffer, and you use that to store data and instructions. That's what it is. So for cost and performance reasons, you have a hierarchy of caches because a fast cache is really nice, but it's also very expensive. So you try to optimize the size of the cache versus the speed, and that has over time has led to a whole, whole range of caches. 
And uh, as we'll see in a short while, some caches are private to a core. So whatever the core changes or reads from is from that cache and other cores don't see it. Uh, but there are also shared caches, which is really nice to share information. For example, when you think about OpenMP, you have a shared variable. Well, wouldn't it be nice to have that in a shared cache so everybody can access it very efficiently? So let's look at a sort of a generic example of what a system looks like these days. So you got the core, the core is doing all the computational work. And what you'll pretty much find in every design is that the core has two, two caches, um, the data cache and the instruction cache. It makes sense to split it because data and instructions behave very differently. So these caches are totally optimized for their use. Um, what you need to know when you when you fetch some element, um, the, the unit of transfer is actually cache line. So wherever your data comes from, you you get more than what you ask for. You want to have a variable, actually you get like thirty two bytes or sixty four bytes or even one hundred and twenty eight bytes, um, where that element is part of. But you get a lot more. And one of the tricks to get good performance is use everything else that came uh, in a cache line. So that's one of those uh, those things that you, uh, I won't be talking about that today, but that's called the cache line and the cache line will come back later. So then in this, uh, in this imaginary architecture, I have a shared cache at what's called level two. So there's a no notion of level, the higher the level number, the further away from the core and further away means in terms of access time. So it's more expensive to get your data from level two than from the D cache as shown there, that's level one. And, and there are designs, they have level three, there have even been designs with a level four. So you have a whole level of, uh, of caches. And in this case, level two is shared, both instructions and data go there. And in case of HPC applications, usually the instruction part is very simple, um, short. You, you spend an awful lot of time in a loop. It could be a long loop, but it easily fits in an instruction cache. Uh, so it doesn't matter. Most of the L2 um, is, is, is occupied by data. But when you, for example, look at the databases, they jump all over the place. And that's why the instruction part plays a role. And that's why um, the sharing is, um, is, is, a, is a good thing but sometimes uh, they compete, the data and instructions compete. Anyway, here's a level three and that's called LLC in my case, it's called the last level cache and it's called last level cache because it connects to the memory. So what we have here is um, we have the cache closest to the memory, furthest, furthest away from the core. And, and you can here see the hierarchy like um, the L2 is, um, is a private cache for that core and the L3 is a, is a truly shared cache. So in that way, you, um, yeah, this is kind of a template for a modern architecture. The rule is very simple. As you move away from the core, the capacity increases, like uh, level one is typical kilobyte, level two is megabyte, but the speed also goes down. And the whole trick of optimization is to keep your data close to that core. So looking at systems, um, one of the nice, trends of today is that you have a system on a chip, SOC or SMP on a chip. So what you have, you have a bunch of cores, you have memory and an interconnect, and that's called a multi-core node. And you probably have all heard about the word multi-core. But inside that core, there's an acceleration technique called hardware threads. And uh, there's, there's some confusion about that. So I want, uh, I want to explain what hardware threads really are. Um, Intel has called them hyperthreads. I, I really don't like that word. I call them hardware threads. Uh, so various, de depending on the design, you may or may not have hardware threads. I think they're really nice. So what are they? Well, a hardware thread is part of the design. So you have it or you don't have it. And how many you have, again, is also part of the design. And they're, they are there. They're sort of a transparent. They're there to accelerate either an, a single X application or the throughput of a workload. And I'm going to explain that with uh, with some, some diagram. The whole idea behind those hardware threads is that um, if the thing that crunches your instructions, that's called the pipeline, is um, is idle because your thread is waiting. Let's say your, your thread is waiting for doing some I.O. You're waiting for the disk to respond to your I.O. request. Well, you're burning cycles, you're burning energy, you're wasting, uh, you're wasting precious resources. 
So wouldn't it be nice if another thread can start executing instead of just uh, being going into an idle loop? That's the whole idea behind these hardware threads. Um, for something that I'll need later, um, each hardware thread has a unique idea in the system. So here's how it works. If here's, I'm running my application and um, if I don't have hardware threads and the thread will wait for something or a cache miss or IO, it will just wait. And meanwhile, the CPU will uh, keep on burning, uh, burning cycles for a while. And when my time slices up, the next uh, thread or the next um, application will come in and sort of history repeats. Many applications have these gaps in the execution. Well, with, with hardware threads, if I have two hardware threads, I can sort of interleave the execution. When the light blue thread is doing nothing, the dark blue one can go in and, uh, and take advantage. And in that way, I save time. That's the whole goal. The reason I, I bring this up is that um, this confusion, people say, well, I, I used those hardware threads and I didn't get any benefit. No, that if you don't have these gaps, if you have a very tight algorithm that's spending all of its time in the CPU and doesn't have any gaps, then adding more threads, as hopefully clear from this diagram, doesn't help you. So don't be confused by that. In many cases, adding hardware threads does help if you have access to them. So um, on the practical side, um, you have these hardware threads and they have a number. Here's an imaginary number, numbering scheme. And when I go to the NUMA part in the end, we're going to, uh, I'm going to uh, revisit this because that's why we're going to need these numbers. So let me move into part one and just lubricate my throat. Sorry for that. What could possibly go wrong? Well, nothing, of course. Very easy, it could be a really short talk. Or maybe, maybe there are some things that we need to talk about. As nice as OpenMP is, OpenMP is a, is a shared memory model. And with as with any shared memory model, there are things to watch out for. So where could things go wrong? There are sort of three categories. You can get wrong could mean that you get an incorrect answer. Well, that's like a game over. You got to fix that. You could have poor parallel performance. Well, that's not nice. You could have the combination. You could have a wrong answer and terrible performance. And that actually, uh, I, I do have one, one small example of that a little later, but I will focus on the two disjoint things. We'll talk about correct answers and, and good performance sort of separately. But that's what I mean when wrong. And before I go into the details, um, I need to explain how an OpenMP program sort of works. You have your code, your, your sequential code. Now you're going to use OpenMP. So you're going to add the OpenMP controls to it. You've, you've learned that in the previous trainings, the pragmas and the, the function calls. So that, tra that transforms it into a parallel program. Then you need to have a compiler that supports OpenMP that takes those controls and those pragmas and understands those functions and turns that into a parallel OpenMP executable. Now, luckily, about every compiler on the planet uh, understands and supports OpenMP these days, so that's not big of an issue. But it is the reason why, for example, on GCC, you need to use the dash F OpenMP option to tell it this is an OpenMP program. Otherwise, those pragmas will be ignored. And then you start running your program, and in conjunction with the uh, OpenMP runtime library, you start running your program. So where do things go wrong? Well, there could be an issue, could be a bug in the runtime library. It's very, very, very un uh, unlikely, uh, certainly if the, if the compiler and runtime have matured for a while. So um, that would not be the, the first suspect. There could be an issue in the compiler where it does, does have a glitch when it translates your OpenMP controls to executable code. Not very likely, you never exclude a compiler bug, but what I see, most of the errors start here when you when you try to parallelize your code. In other words, it's usually the user that does something that's not right. And again, never exclude compiler, um, compiler or runtime issues, but it shouldn't be the first thing to look at. So I try to identify the top three of what I see with, where things go wrong. First of all, the code has been incorrectly parallelized. Well, that seems so obvious, but um, it's not. People do make that mistake. Uh, you've learned about the scoping, private shared uh, variables. 
um, you don't you didn't apply those rules in the right way, or, or a data race. A data race is probably among the most uh, most common errors in the parallel uh, in, in the shared memory parallel programming program, including OpenMP. So let me elaborate a bit on that. First of all, you have a bit of a code here, and what's hidden, sort of hidden. This is a, this is this this kind of the kind of code that looks like to be optimized for sequential access, where people actually try to be smarter than the compiler, which is in these days not a good idea. So there's this uh, scalar variable previous value that's being used. Well, there's a data dependence. Because if you rewrite this the way you should actually write it from the from the from the start, you can see that the computation of a of i depends on b of i, and presumably those are independent. But it also depends on the previous value of a. So a one needs a zero, a two needs a one, and that means there's a dependence. That means I can't execute this in parallel. So there is independence, but through that scalar variable, and of course that could be in a very complicated loop, not not like two lines that I'm showing here. Um, that that would give you um, that would give you a wrong answer if you if you parallelize it. Now the beauty of OpenMP is you can try it, and that's what I did. So I just jammed in a pragma OMP parallel four, and I uh, am printing here the uh, the results. So I compile OpenMP. Set the number of threads to four, and um, and my code flags six errors. So this is kind of scary. It's scary because three results are okay, and um, that means if this is deeply buried in your application, it could be a really pain to find it. But yeah, such is such is life. Um, but that's the scary nature of these kind of things. It's not it's not entirely wrong. It could even be that only one is wrong or from run to run, it depends. If I take that other version um, with a straightforward dependence and I force the compiler to parallelize it, you see I get the wrong answers, but I get different wrong answers than on the previous slide. So now six, five, sorry, five values are correct, four are wrong, and the wrong values are different than the one on the previous slide. Very scary, but it's real. So don't do that. Don't parallelize what you shouldn't parallelize. So that's why I say when you parallelize code that's not parallel, you can maybe you get wrong results. That's uh, really again the the nasty thing. And um, there's a simple trick for a loop um, that I have used quite a lot and still do. Uh, if you want to know whether the loop is parallel, run the sequential version backwards. You start with the last iteration and you go back to the first one. If the results are wrong, it means that there's ordering in the loop. So you know it's not parallel as written. Maybe you can rewrite it to eliminate a uh, dependence or you can isolate the dependence in, a, in a, like a single region. But as written, you can't just jam in a pragma uh, OMP4 or, or, or OMP2 in Fortran. The bad thing is if the results are okay, you still don't know. There still could be something nasty in it. It works only one way, which are very, very easy to do. Quick check if you have a very complicated loop to see if uh, if there's any chance of just having it run in parallel before you start running it in parallel. So um, for an incorrect parallelization, always uh, only focus on what matters. I already said that. Um, when you find parallel version, make sure that the parallel version is still pretty efficient on a single thread. So you run your OpenMP code and you set number threads to one because you want to make sure that um, that you don't lose too much. And again, I'm saying that because there are algorithms that don't have that and I wouldn't go that way. Um, if there's a sequential part isolated, that's why the single uh, single region is so, so nice and parallelize the remainder. Uh, sometimes you need to introduce extra extra data structures like extra arrays, vectors. Uh, you can do so, but be careful. If they're very large, you could you could bust your uh, your caches and uh, and lose performance that way. So be careful introducing extra memory. Another um, type of wrong answers is the the scoping rules. 
Um, I actually, in my previous example, I had that as well. I had, um, I, I sort of glossed over that, but my uh, preval was implicitly shared. That's one of the, the scoping rules in OpenMP. So that variable is a shared variable. And, and then what happens is that um, multiple threads try to read and write the same value, the variable, sorry, and they deposit different values in it. It's, uh, it's actually called a data race. So I'll, I'll get back to that in a minute. So uh, I made a mistake in my scoping. Um, and, um, and as a result, I, um, I get a wrong answer. So that already is a wrong answer case. So I had two bugs in my program, not one. Uh, the solution is like in um, is, is like in this case uh, make it sort of private. Uh, when you have private variables, the most common mistake is that people don't realize that a private variable is undefined outside of the parallel region. It doesn't inherit the value. So let me show you here. Um, if I would declare that variable my var to be private, so each each that has its own copy. I got a bug in my program because although in the sequential version my my var is initialized to ten, when I go to OpenMP, I lose that private variables are undefined on entry and exit. So even if even if you might be sort of well, I wouldn't call it lucky, but it might work today, but it won't work tomorrow. So um, this is a classical case. You know, people forget that that variable is not initialized. And this is such a common case that OpenMP has the first private construct, which is really nice. In this case, it is a private variable, but it gets pre-initialized with whatever value it had prior to the parallel region. Very powerful concept, very nice. Um, and uh, yeah, use it to your advantage. On the scoping, um, OpenMP has default rules like what is shared, what is private. Other than some very obvious cases, I um, I will be very careful. Uh, think about the variables yourself. The rules can be quite subtle. Uh, I don't know them. I don't know all of them. I refuse to clutter my brain with it. I try to think about my variables, what they should be shared or private. That's a much better strategy. For example, um, when you have variables and when you do C and you have a, a code block and you declare those variables local to that uh, code block, they're automatically privatized, which is probably what you want. And then you only need to scope whatever was left uh, that wasn't part of that code block. So it's not, not such a big deal in many cases. Um, and it's definitely worth spending time on thinking about your variables, whether they should be shared or private so I wouldn't rely on the on the default rules. The last category is a data race. It's the most common uh, error in a, in a parallel shared memory parallel program, whatever it is, not necessarily OpenMP. Um, you have a data race if you if all of the three the three conditions are met. There are multiple threads and they access the same memory location concurrently at the same time. At least one of those accesses modifies the contents of that memory location, and you don't do anything to control exclusive access to that location. You just let things happen. And a data race leads to silent data corruption. And as you saw in my earlier examples, the wrong, the wrong results are also non-deterministic. It can, can drive you pretty crazy to, uh, to, to identify uh, where the data race originates. So uh, even identical runs uh, could produce different results from run to run. And here's a, a classical example. I'm updating a variable that I called my shared variable, and I'm just summing up the elements of an array. But I make that variable shared. Well, I just, by making that variable shared, I just generate the, the conditions that I outlined on the previous slides. I have a uh, one variable, it's one memory location, all threads try to update it. They try to read and write from my shared var, and they presumably do that more or less at the same time. So I've created the ideal conditions for data race. So this is a data race, and this is a wrong um, example of, um, of a wrong code. Luckily, this kind of uh, scenario is so, so common that OpenMP has the reduction clause to handle that. In this case, to sum up the elements of a vector, 
uh, what it does behind the scenes. Uh, the compiler will generate code where at first each thread will accumulate a, a, a section of A uh, in a private variable. And then in the end, you merge all those private contributions into the final my shared var uh, variable. And that's all handled by the compiler. So in this case, there's an easy way out. Uh, just make uh, make this a reduction um, construct. That's not always the case. So always be alert, alert for uh, uh, data races. One golden rule is, is use private variables as much as you can, because when you have a private variable, by definition, you don't have a data race and only use shared variables where needed. And I, I realize that's a very general statement to make, but it's sort of the, 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 the different way of thinking that you need to apply when you uh, use a shared memory model like OpenMP. So data races, yeah, they're really nasty. They're, they're like a terrible to, to encounter. And luckily OpenMP very often has some help to, uh, to avoid them. Um, there are things like atomic operations, critical regions, barriers, and locks, and I'm sure they're going to be covered in this training that, uh, that are meant to avoid data races. So uh, please use them where you can and, um, and don't write data races, please. So on the performance side, and from here on, I'll, I'll start focusing on performance. Uh, what is the top three? There's too much parallel overhead and, um, for example, people clutter parallel regions all over the code, like a parallel region here, a parallel region there. Don't do that. Try to, to minimize the number of parallel regions. Try to consolidate as much work in a parallel region as possible. Load balancing, not all threads do the same amount of work. There's a schedule clause to handle that. So if you have an irregular uh, workload distribution, the schedule clause is very convenient. Um, a more fundamental solution is tasking. You can look into tasking. Tasking can ideally deal with the, those situations. And the third one is NUMA. And that's why the last part of this uh, this training session is, is focusing on NUMA. So I'm, I'm not going to say much about it um, because you'll get exposed to a lot of NUMA stuff very soon. So to summarize this first part, um, I try to give you some sort of a feel for what could go wrong very quick. I know that, but hopefully it, 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 it sort of changes the mindset, makes you aware of a couple of things. Um, always check for correctness. Uh, I tend to make like baby steps and check for correctness um, because once you have completed all of your OpenMP work and OpenMP is all over your code, it'll be much harder to track a wrong answer problem than you do that step by step. So be careful. Make sure you have some reliable reference set you can compare against. And, um, and also try it with different thread counts, just to make sure that the error is not th uh, thread count related. So, um, and again, uh, when you start tuning, uh, use a profiling tool to guide you what to tune. So that brings me to uh, part two, how we're doing on time. I think we're fine. So from now on, I'll only okay. be talking about computer memory. And, um, the motivation is the following. There was a bank robber, bank robber, and uh, when he got arrested, they asked him, why do you rob banks? Well, the answer was astonishingly simple. That's where the money is. So when I get asked, why do you always talk about memory? Well, that's where the biggest bottleneck is. You can do CPU optimizations, and you should, um, but that'll give you um, 3x, maybe 5x when you're very lucky. When you talk about memory, um, the, the performance loss can almost be uh, unlimited. So um, the impact, usually the impact of memory on the performance is much bigger than the CPU. The other thing is, is that compilers have gotten really smart in doing CPU level optimizations. It gets harder when it comes to the memory. So the reward could be much higher. You can, again, you need to do both, but um, the penalty for bad memory, uh, bad memory behavior could be very substantial. So, well, what do you have with OpenMP? Well, the nice thing is memory access just happens. You need variable A, you will get variable A. That's, that's the beauty of it. But there are two things that can get in the way of your performance, and they're called NUMA and false sharing. I want to point out uh, NUMA and false sharing have nothing to do with OpenMP. They are a result of the fact 
uh, that we use um, distributed shared memory systems and a shared memory programming model. So you can have the, exactly the same things in Java or POSIX threads. So it's not related to OpenMP, but since we're using OpenMP, we'd better be aware of it and see how we can, uh, can handle it. So before I focus on the NUMA, I wanted to mention false sharing. The reason is that usually when I talk about false sharing, there's at least one in the in the audience that says, hmm, that might explain the performance mystery that I was looking at, and I had no idea where it came from. So I'll be fairly quick, um, but it is something on the checklist as sort of the last thing, but it, it is um, it is important to, uh, to, to be aware of. So it happens, false sharing happens when multiple threads modify the same cache line at the same time. For correctness, they shouldn't be modifying the same element in that cache line at the same time, that's a data race. But if, if you load an array, let's say you load a vector, and um, when you load A0, you get a boatload of other elements, maybe um, depending on the, on the data type, you could have eight elements of that array in your cache because that's the size of the cache line, maybe on the system that you're using. So, um, so you, you're loading a bunch of data and when threads start modifying the same line, so now we talk about the cache line, that's when uh, alarm bells should go off because the cache line starts to move around to whoever needs to do the update. And there's a thing called cache coherence. You can do shared memory programming because the hardware supports cache coherence and that's a topic in itself, but it sort of tries to maintain consistency across the whole system so it knows what has been modified. Um, I won't talk about cache coherence here, but I do want to talk about false sharing. And here's, here's like the hello world equivalent of false sharing. I have a parallel region, and in that I have a shared variable A. Uh, that's a pointer, pointer to a vector. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to have each thread update its element. So I get the thread idea through the function called OMP get thread num. So that's uh, starting with zero. Um, and then I do I initialize A using the thread ID as an index and I initialize the value to zero. Well, that looks like a very, very, very innocent operation. And it is, if not for the case that I just created the conditions for false sharing. Um, a Elements of, um, how do you call that? Yeah, subsequent elements of A are part of the same cache line. Not all of them, but like I just said, a cache line could contain like eight elements or four elements. So you have a bunch of those vector elements in the same cache line. I'm doing an update, and this is in a parallel region, so presumably I do the update at the same time. So how does that work? Why is this false sharing? Well, let's say I just have four elements. And the first thread... Uh, by by design of this code will modify A0. So it will deposit zero into A0. Then the next thread will try to update A2. And so what I have, this is in a parallel region. So this actually happens at the same time. And, but the cache coherence will ensure that uh, the sort of the cache line will go from one cache to another. Um, so that cache line starts traveling, and then I got thread one, and then the thread three. So that cache line will go from one place to another. And each time that I do a modification on a cache line, the status of the cache line needs to be updated. That costs you cycles as well. And as innocent as this seems to be, um, uh, false sharing can cost you a lot of performance. Uh, usually when it when it happens, it's pretty bad. Um, and um, so it's something you want to avoid in the heart of your algorithm. There's always some false sharing going on. That's fine. But when it's in the heart of your algorithm, don't do that. Uh, and here's, here's the thing that I alluded to a little while ago. When you have a data race, when you look at the conditions of a data race, it's almost the same as false sharing. The difference with the data race and generally false sharing is that a data race updates the same element. So it's the ultimate case of false sharing. You're all hitting on the same shared variable, but the mechanism is the same. So um, that's why when you have a data race, your program runs slower. And it's one way of finding out whether you might have a data race, your program uh, doesn't scale very well. So um, as I just said, 
Cost sharing is important, but it is a corny case. And I want to talk about NUMA, the, the remainder of this talk. That's much more likely to hit you, to affect you. And um, so I am going to talk about NUMA from now until the, until the last slide. So uh, bear with me. I'll try to make it um, sort of informative and pleasant, but uh, we will go deep in a couple of places. Anyone have so, any questions so far? Sorry? I was asking if anyone have any questions so far. If you want to ask any questions, uh, type in the Slack or uh, if you want to unmute. Not, uh, let's go on, please. You're all the, everybody's still there, I hope. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so let's, um, let's, uh, let's talk about NUMA now. And um, one of the things is about NUMA is that NUMA used to be when I sort of grew up, NUMA used to be the realm of very, very large systems. Only the people that had the luxury of having these really large shared memory systems were exposed to the NUMA situation. But NUMA has come down. Even a two-socket, small pizza box kind of style system typically has a NUMA architecture. And with with some systems, there's even NUMA inside the chip. Uh, so... So NUMA is so much present that's, um, that it's, it's really important to, to consider. I said that most likely the system that you, you're using has, um, has NUMA. I know the ones that NERSC have, they have the NUMA architecture. But um, in general, they're, they're everywhere. So um, again, you're no longer off the hook. And it's a concern to all. And again, it, it's the mixed blessing that things just work. But how efficient is your code, really? So let me look at a generic, but quite a common uh, NUMA system. Here's what, it, what we call a node. A node, um, a node has a bunch of cores, it has a bunch of caches, and there's a last level cache that connects to memory. And then what you do, you connect multiple nodes through a special interconnect. This is the difference between a cluster and a shared memory system. It's the interconnect. When you have a cluster, you just have a regular uh, standard network. When you have uh, a shared memory system, there's a proprietary sort of custom designed interconnect that actually it, it supports that cache coherence that I briefly mentioned earlier. And in a, in a nutshell, cache coherence means that the system will see all activities across all the caches in the memory. So there's a lot of bookkeeping going on, and that's why you have to custom design it for the system that you're building. But it's great to have as a programmer because it relieves you of, of keeping track of what's going on. So that, that's done in the hardware. And that turns this into a, um, a four-node um, shared memory system. Through the cache coherence, you have what's called a single system image. It appears to you as one, one physical system, which it is, but you don't see the, the, the distributed memory kind of nature of the, uh, of the whole thing. And what you have, you have the memory scattered over, in this case, four nodes. Again, you don't see it when you use a tool like TOP. TOP will happily report to you uh, the total amount of memory, and it, it won't it will show you how it's uh, distributed over those nodes in case there are multiple nodes. So the reason to do NUMA is shown here. That's the, that's essentially the yellow um, the yellow uh, dots here shown. Because before NUMA came, uh, everything was connected to a fixed interconnect with a fixed bandwidth. It was called the bus architecture. It was a bus. And it meant that if you added uh, processors, you would be starving your system for bandwidth. So the, there will be a moment that adding processes wouldn't help you because you, you couldn't feed those processes quickly enough. Um, with, with, with this kind of design, you don't have that anymore. You add a node, you automatically add memory bandwidth. Now, the price to pay is the distributed nature of the memory, but it gives you a much more scalable design. Another thing, and I wouldn't downplay that, but it's a little easier in a way these nodes, one node is a little easier to design than a whole entire system. So it's like your building blocks, still a massive effort to uh, to design and build a node. But um, the biggest thing, the big, biggest driver behind NUMA was the, uh, was the bandwidth. 
for us as developers, this is the way to look at it. I have my threads running somewhere. I have my data scattered over the system and there's some magic in between that glues it all together. Um, so the official way of saying it, memory is physically distributed, like in my case, over four nodes, but logically shared. And shared data, as you know from OpenMP, is accessible to all the threads. So that's really nice. Uh, you don't have to know in terms of OpenMP, you don't have to know you, where the data is. It doesn't matter. Uh, you need variable A if it's shared, any thread can get it. But how about performance? Where does that A come from? And that's where the new architecture comes into the picture. So going back to my uh, very high level picture, uh, let's say I'm running my application on it and the, the one of my threads executes in the top left corner and it needs some data. Well, the quickest way to have it is it from your local memory or, or local cache, but uh, we talk about memory here. So, um, that, that's what we call local access. Local access is the best you can do. You can't get any better than that. That's the goal. But this being, uh, this being a NUMA system, you don't know. This could, this could happen. The, the variable could be in the far away corner in your system, and it could take much longer, on the scale of things, of course, to access that, uh, that element. And that's what we call remote ac access, and although there are individual differences, uh, there are different sort of levels of remote, remote access is always slower than local access. So the, the whole goal of NUMA tuning is to avoid that uh, slow transfer and have as many local accesses as possible. So tuning for NUMA means keeping threads and the data close. And a decision was made that in OpenMP, a thread may be moved to the data that it needs. You could move the data to the thread, but that's potentially much more expensive. A thread is is not that it has some state, but it's not that much. So it's much easier to pack up a thread and move it to the data than the other way around. Um, so that was the decision made in uh, in OpenMP. And how do you get that done for you? Because this all happens uh, under the hood. It's transparent. Um, you have the affinity controls, constructs in OpenMP, and I'm going to spend a lot of time on that uh, to show you how you can control where threads are running. And uh, it's very powerful. Uh, it's very easy to set it up, but you've got to get it right. In this case, right is, is not about correctness, it's about performance. So NUMA cannot, can, basically cannot give you a wrong answer. If your program is correct, then NUMA won't change to that, but NUMA tuning will improve your performance. So when I say get it right, it means um, performance, not correctness. So we're zooming in on where the data is and where the threads are, because this begs the question, what I was just talking about, where is my data? And for that, we need to go to the operating system. The operating system has a policy where to put your data. It's in charge of everything, including where your data goes. And I must mention here that data allocation, when you talk about the operating system, Linux, Windows, whatever, Mac OS, it's at the page level. A data page is a larger chunk of data. Uh, it's much larger than a cache line. It's you can, like a four kilobyte, eight kilobyte, 16, 64 kilobytes. So you talk about kilobytes of data. And the element that you need is in that page. That's the guarantee that you get. So the operating system is in charge where to place the data. And there are several policies, but that's the default policy. And pretty much all operating systems that I know use first touch. So what does that mean? It means that it, it allocates the, the data and the memory closest to the thread that accesses that page for the first time. And that's really important. Um, the first the first access of whatever fresh data you have will control where its home base is. It's literally called the home node. So the home node is defined by the access pattern. And this is the default on Linux and every every other operating system that I know because it makes sense. Because when you have a sequential application, you just want to have all your data as close to you as possible. So that, that's a very good choice for sequential applications, but not always so good for parallel applications. 
Because what if a single thread initializes most or all of the data? By virtue of the first touch placement policy, it means that all that data ends up in the memory or wherever that thread is running. And then every other thread, as far away as it may be on your system, will need to get and access that, and that's going to cost you performance. So first touch in itself is nice, but you got to be careful in the context of a parallel program. So what you'll see, typically see, is some threads need more time to get to their data. You can also get some congestion on your network if you have a thousand threads and they're all trying to go to the same memory uh, on the same node at the same time. That'll uh, that won't really fly with your network. But in general, the the biggest um, penalty is paid because of the remote memory access that you suffer from. Now, the solution is in most cases surprisingly simple. And let me show you an example. Here I'm initializing a vector to zero. If I wouldn't do anything, one thread would execute that loop, and that's in the bottom, bottom left corner in my imaginary example. So if the thread executes there, it means all the data, all of A, is located there in that single node. Now, that could be what you exactly what you want, but in a parallel program, it's not likely because it's a multi-threaded application that where other threads need access to that data as well. So this doesn't look like a good situation. This is where you can actually leverage first touch by, in, by parallelizing that initialization. Initialization is usually very quick. You don't have to parallelize it for performance, but you parallelize it for NUMA. So what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm turning this into a parallel for loop. And as you have learned, that means that that loop is uh, being um, cut in pieces. Each thread will execute a part of that loop and assume I have four threads. Each of those four threads will initialize a section of A. And what I'll have is that I all have a portion of A in their memory and I have the data spread out. So uh, in that way, I, uh, I have achieved my goal. So one of the things you'll find in uh, NUMA, um, NUMA uh, ready applications is that these things, these like these data initializations have been parallelized for this reason. There, that's not always that easy. How about IO? What if, uh, what if, what if you read a lot of data from a, from a file? Well, that, that's a sequential operation. Um, so you gotta be careful that when well, whoever reads the data will own it. And that's again, not what you want. A classical trick, surprisingly simple, is that you pre-initialize the data, which is which is which is redundant, but you pre-initialize your data structures in a parallel way. And by doing that, you you use the first touch to pre-distribute your your allocation over the system. And then when you do the I.O., the, I, the OS will take care of getting the data distributed over your system. A little trick. Uh, often not that hard to do, but highly efficient. So you you add a redundant initialization because it's not necessary for correctness, but it's for performance. If the data's access, access pattern is irregular, it gets harder. Um, you can look at, uh, there's some placement um, uh, controls. And you can, for example, to ease the pain, you can randomize the data placement. There's a tool called Numa Control. I'll say a little bit more about it soon. And with that, you can you can tell it to, to randomize the data placement, sort of um, pre-distribute -dis your data across the whole system in, instead of having um, having a bottleneck. A little tip, uh, quite a common way of people to allocate memory and have it initialized to zero is the C alloc instead of the malloc. Well, um, when you do that for global memory allocation, as you should know by now, uh, if you use that in a parallel context, then only one thread will, will own all the data that you just allocated. So that's not a good idea. And I want to zoom in on uh, OpenMP support for the NUMA system. So what, what is the toolbox that OpenMP provides you to deal with NUMA? So again, on NUMA system, it matters where your threads and data are. And I mean, I'm going to slow down a bit because I'm going to talk about 
a very important concept. It's called a place. A place is a set. Set could have one element or multiple elements. And that defines where your threads may run. So you, by defining the places, you tell the runtime system where you allow threads to be running. And for the name of a place, you can use a symbolic name like cores, or you could use those thread ideas that I, that I mentioned in the beginning of this talk. So just an imaginary example is I have one place consists of thread a thread that is one, five, seven, eleven, and thirteen, for whatever reason. And with that, you tell the OpenMP runtime system, you have to schedule my threads on those hardware threads. You can't mix in OpenMP. You can't mix uh, uh, the symbolic and the numbers. Uh, that's not a big deal because that's that's not a natural thing. Either you use the symbolic names, or if you really want to go low level, you use the numbers. So this is the um, philosophy that I just uh, mentioned already. The data is where it happens to be, and, and uh, you're going to move a thread to the data where, it, where it's needed most. And you have your two environment variables to control that. The first one is OMP places. OMP places defines those sets. And again, they allow you, they allow the runtime system to schedule threads in places. So you can make it as wide or as small as possible. It's totally under your control. Then you have the proc bind variable that does the mapping of the threads to the places. Why do you need that? Well, I could have 12 places and when I'm running four threads, I need to tell the system how to map that onto those places. And that's what you do through the proc bind variable. So these two variables are together, they're remarkably powerful. Uh, when you start playing with this, um, I would highly recommend to set an environment variable called OMP, OMP display env and set it to verbose because at program startup, that will echo a settings, including the places definition that you have uh, set. So um, yeah, it has saved me more than once by checking that because it's easy to make a mistake with this stuff. So what are the choices you have for OMP places? The lowest level is threads. That means that um, you have a selection or all of the hardware threads uh, that the uh, runtime system can choose from. A core, so that's a higher level. You could tell my places are the last level caches. And the, the, the runtime system will know the cores that share a last level cache. So what you say, I don't care which cores or threads you use, as long as they share a last level cache. Then, and again, at a higher level, the NUMA domains, so like the nodes that I was showing, they share a memory and they have the same distance to that memory. So that's the NUMA domains. And then sort of the whole chip, a single socket. That's, I wouldn't, I don't think that's particularly useful anymore, but it's still there. And I think mainly for legacy reasons. So first of all, I'm going to talk about hardware thread ideas, but before I do that, I want to talk about abstract names and they're definitely preferred and they are very powerful. So don't get me wrong. I just want to show you the hard side of uh, things uh, knowing there's also often an easier way. So um, you can use those hardware threads ideas and I have an example, but um, uh, again, think about those abstract names first. So, when you use the hardware thread IDs, uh, you just use any sequence of valid numbers. They have to be valid numbers. And uh, since there could be a lot of uh, hardware threads in your system, there's a nice compact set notation. And um, you have a triple of uh, numbers, the starting value, the total number, and the increment. So if you specify as a place, zero colon four is colon two, that means that I um, I have four numbers. It's the middle number. I start with zero and the increment is two. So that, that compact notation expands to zero, two, four, and six. So that means that for whatever reason, I um, my place, and you can have multiple places, but that's a place where you tell the, the runtime system, I don't care. You could run on zero, two, four, or six. I don't care, but it has to be one of those. So some examples, um, you want to schedule, just use the NUMA domains, like the nodes in my imaginary example. That's how you get it. 
You can optionally add a number um, between parentheses um, that restricts it to the number of NUMA domains. So you can say, well, I just want to use two NUMA domains, not all of them. Uh, or go really low level. I want to use hardware thread ideas 0, 8, 16, and 24. That will be this, um, this definition. This definition, and this is where things can get a little tricky. So here I have four places. And um, um, that um, can be expanded in the compact notation. Same as before, same sort of style. So I start with zero. I, I want to have four, and the increment should be eight. So that second line expands to the line above. And it, it's much easier to read, much uh, much uh, more robust. It's uh, it's it's easy to make a mistake with those individual numbers, and the line the list gets very long. So typically, you'll be using the um, um, this compact notation. Then you have the proc bind, and like I said, if you have if the number of places and the number of threads is the same, it doesn't matter. But what if you have more places than threads? Then you need to think about, well, how do I want to place my threads onto those places? So it, it's a mapping function. And you've got a bunch of choices. You can just enable proc bind. I'm not sure how meaningful that is. You can disable it. Mm, yeah, that's usually not such a good idea either. So the, the ones that are really relevant are primary, close, or spread. When you set proc bind to primary, it means that additional threads are, are scheduled close to where the main thread is running in the same, same, same place. This is all in the places context, by the way. So when I say close, it's term, in terms of the place list. Um, you can say close, and that means that in terms of the, of the place list, remember uh, 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 places is a, is a is set based approach. So you have a, a bunch of uh, sets that together form the place list. They want to be them close or spread out. And those are the choices that you have. So um, again, that's in terms of the place list. And uh, let me show you examples. Um, I want to show, I want to run all the cores in the system. And I don't care whether those cores have hardware threads or not. Um, you, you just pick a hardware thread in, in one whatever core. I don't care. Or I want to I wanna run on cores, but they should be as far away as possible. And I set proc bind to spread. So I sort of push them away. And one of the reasons to do that is to maximize the bandwidth in the system. The more nodes you use, the more bandwidth you have. So if you have a very bandwidth hungry application, spreading them out may, may make sense. If instead latency is an issue, you may want to keep them close. So that's why you have these different uh, choices. Now, I need to go back to the, uh, to the example because I wasn't entirely honest when I presented that. Remember just a few slides ago, I showed this and I said you parallelize and four threads, all true. And then I said, because I'm running this way, the data is spread out. That's where I made a sort of mistake. Because how do I know that actually the threads are scheduled this way? I don't. If I don't say anything, it, I leave it up to the runtime system and the operating system to make the scheduling decisions. And this is wishful thinking, nothing more or less than that. This is what I hope to achieve, but I can't count on it. And um, since the, this is quite critical, I need to take matters in my own hand and use the affinity controls. So in this case, what I really need to say is the places are the NUMA domains, my four nodes, and I want them to spread out. So if I have four threads, they're spread out over the four NUMA domains that I have. If I have eight threads, each, each NUMA domain will have two threads because clearly that's what I want. So this is why you need those controls and, um, and uh, yeah, think about it. And the good thing is it's quite easy to do some experiments with it. You can see how the performance varies as you make different, different choices. So um, I would definitely recommend um, doing that, do some experiments unless you really know upfront what, what is best for you.
Now, another nice thing, and Helen has been quite instrumental in that, is um, to provide you more support because it's really um, it's really uh, easy to make a mistake with this stuff. So there's a display env that I already mentioned, but there's also a display affinity, and that prints information at runtime. So you can actually see what happens in terms of your places and the binding as your program executes. And it has a programmable sort of interface, so it's quite flexible. And I really would encourage you to uh, to use those when you start setting up your NUMA settings. Again, it's very easy to make a mistake, but you don't see that mistake other than that you lose performance. So um, I can't stress it enough. Use these tools, as simple as they are, they're extremely powerful. So I want to conclude with a, um, a an example, just showing where everything comes together. Um, and I take my favorite algorithm, multiplying a matrix and a vector. It's very simple, conceptually very simple, but it has some nice uh, components. So this is um, this is the way you would do that in C. You take the dot products of the row of the matrix times the vector, and each dot product is independent. So this is really parallel. So I can parallelize that over the rows of the um, of the matrix, and that's what I'm doing here with my uh, parallel four. So very easy to parallelize, and it's what we call embarrassingly parallel. All these dot products are independent, so that's nice. Um, and um, so this is embarrassingly parallel algorithm. I hope you um, you all agree. And then I run it, and I don't get embarrassingly parallel performance at all. This is not a typo. As I add threads on this system, and I'll go into the configuration of the system in a minute, the performance actually goes down. It doesn't go up. That's not really what we want to achieve with parallel programming. So what's going on here? Well, I found an interesting feature in, um, in, in Linux. Um, I think Red Hat came up with it. They have what they call NUMA balancing. You can move tasks, threads or processes closer to the data, or it's interesting, they also allow the system to move the data to the threads. I don't think that's likely to happen. I think it's more the other way. And you can enable or disable that in your kernel. And this is the this is the low level way. There's probably a, a control function to do that, but this is the, the, the hacker's way to do it. And in that way, you can enable or disable uh, that if you have this these kind of privileges, of course. And I was just curious with my very bad performance, what, what was going to happen? And guess what? The performance improves with the NUMA balancing enabled. Now, performance is still pretty bad. I mean, I get, I get some sort of scalability um, going from one to eight threads, but after that, it's pretty much game over. Still, it's, it's, it's a gain that I get sort of for free. And it shows me that NUMA does play a role here because clearly I get a benefit um, of 1.6 by enabling some sort of NUMA level optimization in the system. But of course, uh, that's not the end of the story. So when you, when you have access to your system, there's a couple of commands that I always use. One of them is called LSCPU. LSCPU will give you a broad load of information, including the way your, your nodes are organized. And one of the blocks of output is, is, is like this. It will show you the nodes. So I can see that I have eight nodes from zero to seven. And I see, I see these two columns. And in the column, I see a range. And what that means is that zero to seven means that I have eight cores in, in that node, likewise, eight to 15. And the fact that I have two columns means that I have two hardware threads per core. So what, you, what you're looking at here are the low level hardware thread ideas. So for example, uh, somewhere like here, uh, thread number 104 is part of node five. And that's the second hardware thread in the first core there. So this will exactly lay out the, uh, the numbering of the hardware threads across your, uh, across your system. And uh, if you want to use those hardware threads, this is really valuable information, of course. Another uh, tool that I use is NUMA control. NUMA control gives you um, various types of information as well. One of the things I wanted to show you is the latency table. It shows you the nodes. 
and you see it's it's a matrix and um you see the the, the it's a symmetric matrix and it shows you the relative latency normalized to 10 not normalized to 1 that's for for the the scheduler in the OS needs that so the latency from node 0 to 0 is 10 yeah. normally you would expect it to be 1 but again it's a scale to 10 and one to one is ten. So that's that's like the reference. And what you see here in this um, highlighted line is that the latency from node zero to node one is sixteen, and from two and three it's sixteen as well. Then it goes up. So I have two differences of latency. Uh, so that makes it a, a more complicated NUMA system. The first part already shows there's NUMA because the access from to node one, two, and three is longer than to myself. So the local access is faster, um, but I have two types of remote access. So there's a lot of information in here. The one thing is you can't really take these system, these numbers literally. Be careful. It's not said that it's exactly like two times slower, but it's definitely going from node three to four. There's a performance penalty. So combining that information. And yes, this is a very old AMD Epic system, but it's um, it's a nice system to play with for performance reasons. So what I found, I have eight NUMA nodes. And I have two levels of NUMA, level 16 and 32. I also saw that each NUMA node has eight cores with two hardware threads each. So this system has 64 cores, 128 hardware threads. And it's a pretty, a pretty uh, interesting NUMA architecture. So... This is kind of the NUMA topology. Um, whenever I'm in a center node, like my node zero, but again, situation is very symmetric. Um, I have my remote node, the, the yellow ones. Those have the access time of, let's call it 16. And then further away even. So I have two levels of NUMA in this, uh, in this system. And um, that's just the way it is. And um, and with the LSCPU information, you know where things are and you know where you really would like to have things run. So zooming in, uh, when you just look at, and again, it's a very symmetric situation. When you look at node zero, uh, when you look at those numbers, you see that the first core has zero and 64. Th those are the two hardware threads. So if I if I um, if I reference uh, hardware thread zero, I know that's the first hardware thread in the first core. The second hardware thread has ID sixty four, not one. And the reason is that, as you can see in this diagram, if I just want to use the first thread across uh, all those cores, I just have the uh, sequence zero to seven. So it's a choice. Uh, and uh, and and again, you have the information to uh, do this kind of mapping. And with that, I can start looking at my um, at my code again because my code, uh, my algorithm has been parallelized. But how about my data initialization? Because I didn't say anything about that, and by now uh, all the alarm bells should go off because I still have that first touch thing to deal with. So how about the data initialization in this algorithm? I didn't do anything initially. So that means the data was initialized by one thread and I have the classical situation, all data in a single node. So let's look at a more NUMA friendly data initialization. This is my code. I initialize um, my vectors and I initialize the matrix. But if I don't do anything, this is not going to work very well. So what I'm, um, what I'm showing you here is the OpenMP way. And the way you do it, you do some sort of reverse engineering. Um, I know that uh, portions of the matrix B will be accessed by a thread. That's the static scheduling. You, you cut up the loop in, the, in, in blocks. And again, I do reverse engineering how the algorithm is accessing the data. And then I figure out how I should do my data initialization. And for this, this, uh, this the particular algorithm, this is the way to do it. Now my data initialization is in line with the way the data is accessed later on. There are two things to uh, point out. Um, first of all, how about vector C? Vector C is read by all the rows of the matrix. 
So they need access to all of C. And it's very tempting to think, well, maybe I should give every thread a copy of, uh, of C. Well, that would lead to memory waste. It makes the code more complex. Instead, what I do, I initialize the initialization of C. And uh, what that means is that a, each thread will have a, a section of C in its memory. The other parts are elsewhere. But since all, all the rows are needed, after the first time, I've read all of C in my cache. And if it's not in the level one cache, it for sure it will be in the level two cache. So I have initially a little bit of a cost, but then I can take advantage of the caching. So I don't have to do anything complicated by, by copying CE or whatever. So this is where caching really helps me. Um, Paranoid me also initialized the result vector, which is redundant for correctness, but um, the initialization of AI is uh, because the same things that are true for loading data is also for storing data. Before I can store data, I have to own that cache line. So in this way, I, I pre-distribute um, the, the result vector over my system. It's a little, little fine tuning. I don't think you can measure the difference, but I put it in to, um, to show you the different way of thinking. Um, then I have my, my, my thread placement that I have to think about. And um, let's say in this case, I want to distribute all the threads evenly across the cores and the nodes. That's my goal. So for example, I want to use the first hardware threads of the first two cores of all the nodes. How do you go about that? Well, here's a little diagram. So in this case, let's say I want to only use those light blue colored threads. Then I have to figure out the number and that's shown here across the whole system. So I need to generate a sequence for my places because we, remember places are where I allow the system to run and I want them to run for, I mean, for educational purposes, I'm showing that I want them to run in 0, 1, 8, 9, 16, 17, all the way to 56 and 57. That's my goal. How do you do that? Well, you define your places and I, uh, I break it in two parts. So I have a sequence starting with zero. There's going to be eight numbers and the increment is eight. And I have a sequence where I start with one, increment is a total of eight and increment is eight. And if you figure that out, you will see that that's exactly the list that I want to have. So with this places definition, I'm going to have these, um, these 16 places uh, and that was my goal. And to confirm that, when you look at the numbers here, that's exactly what uh, what I'm uh, what I'm doing here. So, so that's how you go about that. Then, in this case, it doesn't matter how I set the binding. I could have left it out because I uh, I'm using sixteen threads on sixteen places. Um, uh, so, really, again, I should change this example because the binding here doesn't matter. I run my program and look at the performance difference. It's remarkably faster. The green one was already with that NUMA tuning at the OS level enabled. And now I leverage first touch. Uh, what I get is I get 34x uh, all the way to 64. I have some really strange behavior in between. I never got to look into that. I think that's probably the, the complicated NUMA architecture. I probably could do a better job in uh, distributing things on 32 threads. I was just focused on the 64 thread case. So there may be more to be gained. I don't know. It will be interesting lab exercise. Uh, um, and um, and ultimately, compared to what I had, the code is at 22 times faster. And that's sort of highlighted here. Um, if I run on one thread, in the, my, my initial performance is five gigaflops. And of course, there's no benefit of first touch because there's only one thread. Then if I didn't do any sort of NUMA optimization, my peak performance is at 56. And um, uh, I get I get eight if I don't do anything. Um, but then when I start levering for first touch on 56 threads, it's 14 times faster. And ultimately on 64, it's it's almost 20, 22 times faster. And the speed up overall is um, is close to 35. And remember, all that I did, I changed the data initialization. I didn't touch my algorithm. Algorithm is exactly the same. Code is the same. 
So this, I, I'm showing you this to show the importance of uh, data initialization uh, when you do your NUMA tuning. So uh, takeaways, um, I hope by now it's clear that these, these things do matter. Uh, you can play with first touch. First touch is very powerful. You can get it to do what you actually you wanted it to do, but you gotta you gotta think about your strategy. And I do think that OpenMP with very few controls, you can do quite some magic on your Numa box. Um, but hardware continues to evolve, and with that, OpenMP continues to uh, evolve and expand the Numa support. For example, the Numa domains is a relatively new addition to um, to OpenMP. So uh, before I finally stop talking, um, the wrapping things up, I hope uh, this has been helpful to help you uh, tune your, your, your code. Again, use a profiling to, tool to tell you where, where to tune. Um, performance tuning generally is frustrating and iterative, but eventually you will prevail and get your code to go faster. If nothing else explains your performance mystery, think about NUMA and maybe false sharing. Uh, I hope not both, but uh, certainly NUMA is um, is something to consider. And think ahead with what do they mean with that? Well, um, don't leave anything up on the table. Um, then I didn't talk about Amdahl's law at all here, but it essentially is anything you leave on the table, you don't you don't fix, will get you as you start scaling your code to a larger number of cores or threads. So um, write efficient code. Uh, don't 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 be wasteful when it comes to performance, and you should be in in good shape. So with that, um, I finish uh, the talk. And remember, if somebody comes to you and says OpenMP doesn't scale, correct that person and say bad OpenMP does not scale. So that concludes the um, the presentation, and I think we can go to the uh, Q and A part. Yeah, uh, you thank you so much, uh, Ruth. It was a great presentation and clear explanation of the concepts, what can go wrong, what the performance concerns, new map, et cetera. Thanks. So I think uh, we do have some questions in the Slack channel. Uh, uh, do you want okay. to be able to see them uh, or should I read to you? Let's see. I don't. Hmm. I think we should go no, with the just... second part first because uh, it's more direct. I don't see. Uh, yeah, let me read to you. Don't worry. Okay. So one question is, um, in the example of doing parallel data initialization, AI is accessed in the parallel region, but A needed to be declared earlier. How does one do that in C or C++ so that the earlier declaration does not place the pages? Well, you can declare. Um, for example, if you do a malloc or a new, in, in C++, nothing happens yet. All you do is you tell the OS, uh, I'm going to need some memory of this size, but it won't do any allocation. The allocation happens when you start using that data. So that's why you gotta be careful. When when are you going to use that data for the first time? So like in my case, I was initializing A, I had declared A, and for correctness, I didn't have to initialize it, but I did that to make sure that it, it was laid out in the right way. But if I if I had, again, the declaration or even a malloc won't, won't control any page placement. So declaration does not place the pages. It's initialization. No. It's, right? it's, yeah, this is why it's called touch technically. For those of you um, uh, into the hardware, the, the, the thread that sets up the TLB, the translation look aside buffer entry, uh, owns the data. And that happens when you start actually using a page in a way. Okay, um, the next question. So is there any way to disable new my rebalancing from the OpenMP runtime? I don't think most cluster admins are willing to disable it at the kernel level. It's a choice. I don't know. It's it's a Red Hat um, feature, and um, uh, I, I don't know. Um, that that's a local choice you need to make. You know, whether uh, whether you you want to disable or enable it, uh, I I would be a bit careful enabling it. I I don't think it's enabled by default, which which usually points to the fact that there are cases where it actually can hurt. 
the real solution is to really tune your code at the NUMA level. Um, I think that's that's the way to go. I was showing it to show that there's, there's something going on with the NUMA, but actually with NUMA control, you can already play a bit with uh, with memory memory choices, memory allocation choices to get a feel for is NUMA really um, really an issue in my code. That would be my preferred way. Okay, uh, next question. Next next question. Do you have any recommendations for tools that can help catch correctness issues, particularly in existing codes? Yeah, I think sort of the holy grail. Uh, I think there have been attempts in the past, but I, I don't think there's much going on at that level to um, to to check code. There, there's there's a lot of effort now in in, in to check sequential applications, but not so much OpenMP. I think uh, even even the, the 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 runtime detection of data races, which is supported by some tools, I think Valgrind does that. Does, yeah. uh, usually, if it's a real code, it gets to be very hard to make that efficient. Could take days to run run a verification job. It could gobble up a huge amount of memory. It's 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 a really tough problem. Yeah, it is, yeah, and I that's why that. I you really need to have a good golden reference set, and make sure that if there are differences, you understand where those differences come from. I think TotalView and DDT does some parallel uh, MPI and OpenMP debugging. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. Okay. Um, can you also suggest profiling tools for Fortran? For Fortran? Uh, well, I know uh, several vendors provide uh, profiling tools. Uh, the tool that we are working on called GProfNG supports Fortran. Uh, it doesn't have OpenMP specific information yet, but it shows you like a, a library library calls uh, related to OpenMP, and it shows you multiple threads. So it gives you a pretty good feel for what's going on. So I do think there are uh, tools. I would think maybe uh, Vtune from Intel, wouldn't they have Fortran support? So to check, check with what's available on your system and, um, uh, yeah, like I said, uh, I think all all major uh, hardware vendors provide some profiling tool. Uh, the one we're working on is is cross platform, so it works on on Intel AMD. Um, and somebody's porting it to uh, Risk Five now. So, um, for mother, we have uh, Lenaro, um, Lenaro uh, Map Profiler, and also the HPE Proof Tools. Mm, yeah, yeah. There's, there's quite some profiling tools out there. <laughs> Great. Um, let's go back to some of the force sharing questions. So, one question is that in your example, would the solution to avoid force sharing to to be updating a in a critical region mm -hmm. is that overhead of running the update seriously, uh, serially is less than overhead caused by cache coherence. So can you can you? So yeah, it, it, to avoid for sharing, with the yep. one of the solutions to be update A in a critical critical region, so yep. that now we're writing this serially. Is that using serial in a critical region? Does that um is is this better than the overhead caused by the cache coherence? Oh, the the overhead by cache coherence is is much much smaller. That's all handled in the um in the hardware. The the big cost is is that your cache line is is. Is unless it's extreme, I must say. You you can I have seen cases where indeed the cache coherence really goes goes all crazy, and you keep on uh, changing those coherence bits. In general, it's more that the line will will start ping ponging through your system, and if it's a fairly large system from a topology point of view, that'll that'll cost you performance. Generally, uh, a critical region is a great way to avoid a data raise. But having said that, if it's a simple update, look into atomic operations. Uh, OpenMP has um, nice atomic constructs. They're meant for uh, simple updates. And when you use an atomic operation, you can take advantage of hardware-assisted instructions, atomic operations, atomic instructions. So that's way more efficient and scales better. So again, if it's, if it's a simple one-line update, 
most likely it can be caught in one of the things that uh, supported with atomic constructs in OpenMP. So try those first. Only when it's more complicated, switch to a, a, a critical region. Um, okay, I think someone is also typing still. Oh, okay, that 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 was uh, I already answered that question about if you uh, bind to numa domain or MP places equals numa domains, are we limited to number of numa domains uh, for the number of threads? Um, so answer is is you can have more threads uh, binding to the same numa domain, so you can have more threads than number of numa domains. Yeah, it depends on how many how many threads you you have in a in a numa domain. You can always oversubscribe. Uh, you need to set um, there's an OpenMP environment variable to allow that. For example, you can run uh, an OpenMP program on a single core if you want. Of course, performance wise, you 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 won't benefit from it, but for testing, uh, that may be useful. So there's not really a, really a link to that. Um, and typically, a, a NUMA domain has, has a number of threads. Okay. Um, I think we answered all the questions. Um, anyone wants to unmute and ask? Or I can wait for you to uh, type. Um, meanwhile, I'd just like to mention that we have a survey. So please uh, do the survey for us. And there is no extra homework for this session. The session for uh, the, the extra homework for the last session applied to this uh, this session's topic, NUMA uh, and SIMD. So for the next session, we will uh, continue with the SIMD concepts and we'll go over NUMA exercises as well. Uh, I was going to do it today, but we are running out of time. Yeah, I'm so sorry for that. Our, the, the GitHub repo already has the the NUMA review exercise. If you want to go review now, if, if it helps for your homework, uh, please do so. Uh, that basically applies to um, what what NUMA and what OMP places and such settings apply um, on parameter. So you can see on parameter what what are the you know exact settings and and the NUMA domains and the CPUs bindings etc. And then the the Benefit of doing first touch, benefit of doing OMP proc, bind equals spread, et cetera. So let me see if there are more questions. That was a bit long. I no needed problem. more time than I thought. I'm sorry <laughs> for that. I enjoy it. You always explain things very uh, clean, careful. Well, story. Thank you. Oh, yeah, actually. That reminds yep. me. It's actually, people want to um, ask more. Can you re sort of re explain the force force touch, a uh, force sharing um, concept? Sorry, yeah, explain some, more about uh, yeah. Some, some somebody thinks I'm not oh, yeah. still not sorry understanding force sharing. If you wanna. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, it was, it's one of those things that I'm that's very near and dear to me. So I try not to get carried away too much and spend too much time on it. But yeah. Well, it's 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 really um, it's really when you, you have to think in terms of cache lines, and um, they're always like at, if you do some let's say you do some update on a vector, there are always edge effects where it could be that uh, one thread works on a part of the cache line and, and another thread works on the other part of the cache line since they sort of cross the boundary. That's fine. That's why I said false sharing always happens. Um, but if it's not really deep inside your key algorithm where you spend most of your time, it's fine. It just happens and it won't cost too much performance. But when it's like the in, in the middle of your your, uh, your 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 algorithm, then it's going to cost you performance. So you what you want to what you really want to do to avoid false sharing in the first place, is to think in terms of private variables. Um, a very general uh, uh, rule with OpenMP that I always apply is uh, use local variables. You can do a local malloc, for example. You can malloc inside a parallel region. Then you initialize whatever you malloc or, or use new, whatever you've allocated, you, um, you initialize. Then you know that thread, whoever executes it, will have only access to that block of memory. You can do all your work in it. And then eventually you copy it out 
do some shared structure, at that point, you probably have some false sharing, but it doesn't matter. It's like order one instead of uh, order n cube. So some false sharing is, is fine. Um, that's hard to avoid, but it, it should be modest. So the general principle is in OpenMP, use private variables and data structures as much as you can. And then, then at some point, you need to save it out of your parallel region. You copy it into your final data structure. Uh, and, and think about things like the reduction clause. The reduction clause is quite uh, flexible in a way, quite common. And then OpenMP will handle everything for you. Thank you. Um, I see one last question. Ravi has a hand up. Would you like to unmute and ask? Ravi? Can you mute it? Right, um, since we can't hear you, uh, feel free to ask in Slack. Um, anybody yeah. who has more questions, please ask in the Slack channel. Um, yeah. I don't know why I don't see the things in the Slack. So Helen, if I, if, if yeah, the, just in, uh, feel free to pass it on to me. Uh, I'll I'll see if I can figure out why Slack doesn't um, doesn't give me updates. But um, yeah, I'll be yeah. happy to answer you questions. Can maybe stay on for one minute, and after the session ends. So let's yeah. thank our speaker again, and we'll end the session today. Thank you very uh -huh. much for joining us, and hope you learn a lot. And uh, remember to join the next session in September. Good luck and enjoy the summer. <laughs> you too.